foamy texture that you'd only normally get if you used fresh espresso. So this is what I do professionally. Also less professionally, <laughs> I am the host uh, of Movers and Shakers. It's a podcast on people and ideas changing the beverage landscape. And if you're interested in entrepreneurship, uh, not only is today's presentation a good fit in terms of topic, but the podcast would be as well. So I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs and I talk to investors uh, within beverage alcohol, particularly about their experiences, their successes and failures in the hopes of helping other entrepreneurs uh, have a bit of an easier time as they build their businesses. So my topic today is called Be the Change You Want to See in the World. And because this is a sort of lofty, abstract sounding topic, I want to lean in a little bit more on the details of what this actually means. So first and foremost, who is the presentation for? It's for hospitality professionals who may be dissatisfied with their current role or career trajectory, want to be proactive building their career, and are curious about building a business of their own. You can also be one of these, or if, again, if you're just curious, great. Um, and what the presentation is for is it's intended to be a roadmap or a mental model for those who have identified something they want to change professionally and they don't know how to change it. So if you're an established entrepreneur with you know, 10, 15, 20 years in the business, this is not the right presentation for you. Please feel free to <laughs> use your 30 minutes doing something else. Uh, okay, but, see ya. <laughs> sorry, say again. See ya. See ya, bye, Jason. <laughs> but if you're somebody who's in an exploratory phase, um, you know, this is probably a, an interesting conversation to be had. So a bit of context on me and why I'm presenting on this topic at all. So I've been in food beverage hospitality for 26 years. 17 of those years were spent in the front of the house. 13 of those years were spent as a bartender. I was a brand ambassador. I was a consultant for Diageo for five years. And I've taught thousands of students how to make cocktails in my in-person classes. So over 5,000 students in those classes, and then about 7,000 in my online classes. And I think the, the reason I wanted to present on this topic today, it's uh, I think a lot of people watching will have had this experience as well, but it happened to me a bit earlier, a few years, handful of years into my restaurant career. So I was still late teens, early twenties. I, uh, I was a very athletic, sporty person and I started having knee issues. I'd already had a knee surgery in soccer from years and years ago, but it made me really start thinking very early on, you know, how do I have longevity in this industry? How long can my body actually sustain this really rigorous work schedule? Because I was working somewhere between 10 and 13 or 14 hour shifts, four to five days a week. And we all, again, everybody in this industry knows that's grueling. So a lot of other questions started coming up as well. I also was not a wildly <laughs> responsible uh, uh, young person with my, with my tip money. And so the question of you know, financial security and financial independence, those started cropping up for me very early as well. Um, and so I kept this all in mind. I was also trying to figure out how I could be more intellectually stimulated. You know, by the time I ended my restaurant career, I had worked in 24 bars, restaurants, hotels, and clubs. And, uh, you know, I really was trying to think of like, how can I stay in this industry that I know and love, but how can I grow more? And how can I increase my career options as I get older rather than decrease them? Because you see that in a lot of industries and you see this in the corporate world at large as well. After you reach a certain age, fewer people kind of want to employ you and you have to kind of fend for yourself. So I started really thinking about these dynamics. So fast forward to 2011, I moved from Boston to New York City. Shortly thereafter, I had the opportunity to be a brand ambassador for Bacardi. So I was responsible for the rum portfolio in New York, but I traveled nationally. And with this, it was an amazing experience. I learned a ton about corporate beverage alcohol. I learned a ton about brand building. Uh, I had benefits for the first time, which was an amazing experience as well. And what I observed at that time also was that there's this massive influx of, you know, highly skilled craft cocktail bartenders where previously that wasn't the case because the contemporary craft cocktail renaissance had really only started uh, in 1999, 2000 with Angel Share and um, Milk and Honey and all of these other New York speakeasies that really jumpstarted this um, this this trend. And what you saw is around the time that I became a brand ambassador, that's when that's when other brand ambassadors, a lot of other brand ambassadors started being employed for a lot of different brands. Now we know there were icons like, you know, Simon Ford and Angus Winchester and Charlotte Boise and all these other folks who had been doing this at a global scale, but there were fewer, fewer opportunities for bartenders like myself um, that had not 
you know, previously held a role like that. So I started thinking about, well, what are the, what are the professional opportunities for, um, you know, people coming up through our industry? And it seemed like there were three very clear ones. Like myself, you could become a brand ambassador, you could become a consultant of some kind, and you could become a bar owner or manager. So eventually when it came the time for me to leave my brand ambassador role and, and move on, and that was for some lifestyle reasons, I didn't want to travel as much. I wanted more control over my time and schedule and, and all these things. I was really at a loss at what my next job was going to be. And I took several months of uh, really just writing and iterating and writing and iterating and thinking about problems that I'd seen in our industry before I took those next few steps in my career. Um, at that, you know, end of that three month period, I had a lot less money, <laughs> which was not awesome, but I had a much better idea of what I wanted to embark upon. And I talk to so many entrepreneurs these days. I have so many friends who are still, you know, who are in bars and restaurants who are trying to figure out in particular in this post COVID, uh, time, what that next step is. And so I wanted to hopefully share a little bit of my learnings along the way and share a framework that I've created, um, you know, for folks in that position as well. So that's why I'm talking about this. Um, I, I would say too, that that idea of entrepreneurship, which I have defined as the practice of problem solving while generating profit, there's a lot of definitions out there, but I came enamored with this idea that you can take your experience and your expertise and your skill set and uh, a thirst for problem solving and you can translate that into into monies, right? That's like that's that's what entrepreneurs do. And I decided this was really the path to financial freedom. Um, what I think was interesting here, and this is just a, a, a quick little um, image that I had pulled up as well. But what's interesting is that in terms of mentions uh, in in uh, social media on Google search, for example, and I got cut off over here, but the the mentions for entrepreneurship. They were virtually non-existent through the early 1900s, but then once we get to 2019, 2020, it's hitting this really critical mass. So I thought that was just sort of interesting that there's all these opportunities for entrepreneurs uh, in our industry and at large at this point that it was worthy of um, pursuing and becoming you know, very important to me as an individual. So I shall present to you April's framework for entrepreneurship. I will be using Cheeky, my business, as a case study. Obviously, this is what I know the best, and I can share real life experience with you. <clears throat> I would say the only prerequisites to changing your mindset from somebody who, excuse my French, bitches and moans about problems that they see <laughs> and is able to act on them is you have to believe change is possible, and you have to believe that you individually can, infect, can affect change. I want to spend a little bit more time on, on, on this slide and this topic because this ties into the description that I had used with my uh, presentation um, brief or seminar brief earlier. We see problems. We're humans. We see problems everywhere we go. And I know hundreds of people in this industry who complain about the POS that they use. They complain about the work dynamics, the tip pool, the hours that they work, the way they're scheduled. And... I actually would say that I think the most disgruntled people are sometimes the people who care the most. They may again have the shittiest attitude <laughs> at some point, but they sometimes are the people who care the most, but they are so frustrated because they don't feel like they can change the environment that they're in or that they individually will be able to impact the outcome. And I think that having this switch in your brain, being able to switch your mindset from saying, I can't affect change to I understand the problem, I've identified the problem, and I can make a dent in this problem. It's incredibly empowering and it will change your life. So that's the only prerequisite to considering uh, a, uh, a venture into entrepreneurship. So again, using Cheeky as my template for this. So I would say step one is you have to look around you for problems. Again, most of us <laughs> have identified all the things that are wrong with our working environment or all the things that are wrong with our industry. And in my case, as a, as a craft cocktail bartender, as a cocktail instructor, and as a brand ambassador, I actually had identified three separate problems that ultimately are now knitted into what is currently my business, Cheeky. Now, I rarely mention all three of these in my presentations because um, it's too wordy. It's too complicated to deliver in this sort of like quick, you know, snappy delivery. But because this is going to be, you know, primarily a, a trade audience that views this presentation, I'll go into all three. <clears throat> 
So batch cocktails, we know anytime you're doing, you're producing events that require volume, you are batching cocktails. It's just untenable to, to be serving the same cocktail at huge volume unless you incorporate some element of batch cocktails. So in my case, as a brand ambassador, I was in charge of executing events for hundreds, if not thousands of people. And so I was also in charge, in charge of sourcing because as we know, the market managers and those folks tended to not have this skill set. So when I was working for Bacardi, when I was working for other brands, when I was consulting for Diageo, this was part of my role is figuring out how we're going to successfully execute these events within the parameters specified by that event. So one of my first insights was working for Bacardi, we would have to either source juice and syrups from bars, or we would have to make it ourselves in contexts that were not uh, ideal for this type of activity. So whether it's preparing these things in hotels or, um, you know, straining juice in like at the bar at a nightclub, there's a whole lot of hoops that we'd have to jump through where I was like, why doesn't, a, why doesn't a better solution uh, exist already? Why can't we source these bar quality items from a vendor? And how do we ensure that that happens at a national level? Because I was having to execute these events nationally. So that was insight number one. Insight number two was uh, if anyone happened to follow my tiny little Instagram uh, back in, I guess it was 2013, 2014, before this whole non-alk spirits world existed, I started experimenting with craft mocktails. So the question of why why does a mocktail have to be this like disgusting, you know, mostly sugary sweet juice concoction? Why can't it be beautiful like a cocktail? And this was, again, this is part of that sort of iterative process where I was like, I don't know what the solution is, but I know that people want non-alcoholic drinks. And this was also partially because when I was a brand ambassador, I was also on the wagon at times and I'd go to different bars and, you know, as much as I loved my bartender friends, they would also feel like I was not engaging in the social occasion if I was ordering a seltzer water or a Pellegrino. So started experimenting with that and didn't know again what the solution would be or if this was just a, a learning experience for me. But I started, you know, making these really beautiful, very high-end mocktails and taking photos of them and posting them to my social. So insight number three was, as I mentioned, at this point, I've, I've taught hundreds, if not thousands of students how to make cocktails at Astor Center, the Institute of Culinary Education, Murray's Cheese, Haven's Kitchen, and a chef demo kitchen called Audrey Claire Cook down in Philly. And what I noticed is as this contemporary craft cocktail renaissance is growing and growing, there's all of these consumers who want to be involved, but they feel less than. They felt really insecure about their abilities. They'd come into these classes so excited, and then immediately they'd be overwhelmed by all the ingredients and all the information presented to them. And so I realized that the problem that consumers have is they're either missing the knowledge, the ingredients, or the time. Like they just don't want to spend the time to prep all of these ingredients in order to make these craft cocktails in the home. So those were my three, those were the three problems I identified. But again, I still had no idea how I was going to combine these into a business. So at this stage, I talked to a lot of entrepreneurs who are like, my idea is precious. Like somebody's going to copy me. I can't talk about it. I've got to keep it like buttoned up in my brain. And, um, and I'm afraid if I share it, somebody's going to steal it. 99.9999999% of the time, people are not going to steal your idea. But I think it's reasonable. I understand why you want to protect your baby, especially if you are really sensitive about the idea. Like if you need... I think you need to know, do you need critical feedback or moral support more and guide your line of questioning to people who can give you one or the other. If you're talking to friends and family who want you to have a safe and secure life, they are not going to say, follow your dreams and put yourself into, you know, into a really risky situation. So take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> Uh, but if you need moral support, you know, maybe you go to somebody who you're just like, they're a big fan of mine. They're not an expert in this. They, they're not a user of the product. But if I just need a bit of moral support to, to push me along my way, wonderful. I'm going to pop back up and, and go to the who, not how. This is actually a, an audiobook that I listened to recently, which has, I think, been phenomenally helpful. And it's, I think, very valuable in particular to people in our industry we are very social beings. We're really well connected. You know somebody who can help you get the answer to your problem a lot faster than you can figure it out on your own. And this is something that I think because I was somebody who was protecting my idea for so long, 
and I was very cautious about who I shared it with, I probably took years longer getting to some of these really important critical conclusions than if I had presented these to people I, I trusted or believed in in the industry. And this is something that I try to do with all of my activities now, instead of saying, how do I find out the answer to this thing? How do I test the viability of an idea or a new product? I immediately go to people I think are highly intelligent and who will give me critical feedback. And I ask them for their opinion. And I ask them for their connections as well, because in this industry, we want to help each other. So I really think, do not be worried about somebody stealing your idea. Most of these ideas take years and years and years to develop. It's all about execution. And somebody who's only partially invested in the outcome or the success of this idea is not going to do it. They're, or if they do it, they're not going to do it well, or they're just not going to do it the same way that you do. So I would highly recommend asking for help and getting a lot of people involved in your journey because people who feel invested in your journey want to help you in the future as well. Um, and then hopefully you'll be able to uh, help them as well. I love that. I love that. It's, I mean, I think all of us have this experience where we're just like so precious about it. And, and I certainly, you know, felt like if somebody gave me feedback that was not like wildly supportive at the beginning, I was afraid that I, it would scare me off of the idea, you know? And so I think and, if, and if that's your concern, you know, maybe keep it a little closer, you know, to the vest for a little while, but, but the more help you have, the faster this is going to go and the easier it's going to be. Continue. Yeah. It's such a good point. It's like, you know, we're not talking about military technology here. We're not talking about, you know, the, the next global virus or it's like, it's nothing is, is, is really so sacred that, um, that, that you can't benefit from sharing it with people. Yeah. And I think too, <clears throat> like, again, it's funny because even with what we do today as cheeky, I mean, there's certain things that, you know, if I, if I feel like we're tracking close to a competitor in terms of like product style or something, maybe I'm not going to be like in two years, I'm going to launch <laughs> this other thing. Yeah. I think it's a brilliant uh, idea, you know, uh, but, um, but besides that, you know, the, the majority of the, I mean, somebody trying to copy you, especially with a, a, especially with a physical product, if somebody's trying to copy you, they're going to have to go through all of the nonsense bullshit that you've gone through, you know, and it's a lot, right. it takes a long time. It seems, it seems like, the, it seems like this, this idea and, um, and, uh, imposter syndrome are closely related. Oh yeah. And I think, you know, I, I honestly, I was a little bit concerned about this presentation in that so much of being an early stage founder, it is about your mindset and, and your feelings of worth. And this is just not talked about so much in, I think in particularly in the entrepreneurial community is, you know, how your mindset and your mental health can make you exponentially a better operator or can really prevent you from, from executing and honestly from just living like a remotely well-rounded life. And so I was a little bit concerned because I'm like, I feel like some elements of this might sound like woo-woo and very like rah-rah, but it is so fundamental to the success. The first you know, three to five years of, of running a, 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 a new business, it is so much about, are you able to continue? Like, do you, do you feel good and excited? Do you have momentum? Mm -hmm. And so the mental health piece of this is so is so critical and the like finding out and we'll talk about this in just a moment but understanding is the thing that i'm working on do i love it this is so important to the success of a business to the longevity of a business that um you know i just decided screw it i'm going to include it um because again for people just getting started the hardest thing to do is to figure out what you want and then to take that first step because you are hung up with so many feelings of why me you know, like if somebody could do this, why didn't they do it already? Like, it's just so much self-doubt. And the more of these little steps that you take and the more feedback you start getting and the more you are able to iterate that, the more momentum builds and builds and builds, and then it becomes unstoppable. So I think, yeah, I think your point is really great. And I'm glad that you brought that up. Cheers. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> the next step uh, the next step that uh, I would say that you would take is to start iterating the solution. So as I mentioned, I knew what some problems were 
for Cheeky, or I knew what some problems were that I felt needed to be solved in our space, or, you know, consumers would be really excited to be able to make better cocktails. I felt like, you know, if consumers can then make at home what they get excited about in bars, they're going to come back to the bars and they're going to order more of them and just be more immersed in this, in this culture. And it just felt really good helping to empower people who felt really insecure about their abilities um, and making them feel great about that and feel great as, you know, as host as well. And so I knew I had a set of problems. I had no idea what the solution was. So I started iterating. And, um, you know, I think most, most people in our industry would have started this way as well. But initially I started doing like little events. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd be making 12 ounces of simple syrup or, you know, hand juicing with a little Rashan juicer. Actually, I started off with a shittier hand press <laughs> first, but then I'd be, you know, I started scaling up my juicer game. And so initially I was doing this at home and I just like bring little batch cocktails to events. And, you know, I had some friends who would, who would let me do that and would then start paying me for these. And then um, I started trying to, to scale this up and I was like, what does this actually take? If I were to try to do a batch cocktail service, like what is this, what does this take? And so the middle actually, I have these a little out of order, but the middle was, um, I, I came up with the idea of, I'm gonna sell these batch cocktails in vessels that are half full. And I'm gonna say exactly how much spirits you need to add on the side. Um, and this is actually, this was not even my first vessel. I had multiple like camping, like five gallon camping vessels where I was like, oh. It was like really crazy. I mean, I have a, I, I wish I had honestly time to just dump all those photos in here, but I, <laughs> I had all these different formats. I would drop them off at events. And I, at this point I had some spirits clients and they were again, super lovely about not being like, why is this in like a camping <laughs> <laughs> thing, but it worked like a charm. And I just knew I had to like get in like the, the, the systems a bit more dialed in. So ultimately I ended up starting to make a really decent business on what you see in the center here, which is I made these little waterproof labels and it said, you know, add X 750s or X liters or, you know, X number of ounces of, you know, whatever the, whatever the base spirits was, base spirit was. Um, we did the garnishes as well. And so I do, you know, packs of 25 or 50 like hand picked mint sprigs or hand cut, um, uh, orange twists or whatever that may be and pack them up really beautiful and take out containers. And the beauty of this was for any, whether it's a caterer or whether it was a spirits brand, they could source the alcohol however they wanted. I didn't have to deal with that. I would help them with the recipe and the, um, and the conversions and things like that. And I would say, listen, if you want to account for, uh, you know, a cocktail and a half or three cocktails per, um, per attendee, this is what I'd recommend. But if you want to be on the safe side, I'd recommend scaling up, et cetera. So, that was working really well, um, profitable immediately because I was not doing things legally, <laughs> which I didn't realize until later. Um, but then I took the next step and I ended up approaching Cocktail Kingdom Logistics. They used to have a, uh, a really large syrups and juice operation. Um, they were operating out their Long Island City warehouse at the time. Mm -hmm. And they had 20 plus people in the kitchen at any given time making all of these custom syrups for a huge amount of the bars and, and large hotels. It was yeah. amazing. It was, it was amazing. amazing, right? <clears throat> it was a great, I mean, it was great, but I, I came on initially, I spent about a month as like a kitchen manager for them, trying to help them work through some of the systems and make them more efficient. And I learned a lot from observing that operation. And we tried to layer my batching and delivery service over that. Um, and it was, I would say, not really very successful simply because the clients that were purchasing there were really looking for like very much wholesale prices. And this was an additional service. So I was much more successful with my catering and event clients rather mm -hmm. than those whole, like converting those wholesale clients, but it was an amazing opportunity. I learned a ton. And that was actually, in fact, where I first learned about HPP technology, um, high pressure uh, pasteurization or high pressure processing. And I thought, starting kind of like taking some steps back and learning more about the industry. I thought that HPP, which extends the shelf life and fulfills the requirements for the FDA to ensure juices uh, is, is safe for consumption. I thought this technology was going to hit the mixer category in the same way or in some similar way to the way it hit the health juice category. So backing out a little bit before I pop into this next version of, um, of, my previous business we can swallow. Um, what we saw within the HPP health juice 
category was there were a, a series of, of companies like Suja and Blueprint and things like that, that scaled really huge and then were acquired, you know, 60, $100 million for the acquisition. But the what happened, and I'll spare you all the details unless you're curious, Jason, but what happened was um, it became clear to me after selling an HPP mixer for several years, the infrastructure is just not there to support HPP mixers, in my opinion, I don't think it's going to be there. I don't think the consumer cares enough. Are you, talking, are you talking about cold chain? <clears throat> yeah. So, um, so just because again, probably the majority of the of the observers will not know this um, as well as you do, Jason. So, um, with HPP juice, the benefit is it maintains flavor uh, and nutritional content better than any other process out there, including any type of heat or light pasteurization. The FDA requires that you apply some pasteurization process if you're going to sell wholesale. So if you're just going to sell in your own little juice bars, you can sell it without doing anything to it. But everything else requires some sort of processing to it. So with HPP, it's great because the flavor is great. But the problem is that it has to be refrigerated at all times. And that was something, again, when you see this bottle on the right hand side, that was the next version of, of my company. Swig and Swallow, which then turned into Cheeky. <clears throat> and this was an HPP mixer. And so the flavor was amazing. It was still that sort of half full bottle where you just add the spirits to the bottle and immediately you'd have 10 to 12 drinks ready, um, like very like high quality bar quality uh, cocktails. But the problem that I saw was that consumers, like shipping stuff through the mail, obviously you have to ship it on ice. It's terrible and very wasteful. Consumers don't have the space in their fridges. And moreover, if you look at the expansion into retail, that is not where the category lives. And if you are taking up refrigerated space next to juices like orange juice or green juice, you are stealing shelf space from higher velocity items. And so for me, I backed out of this and I was like, okay, I've done this for several years. I have learned a ton about this. And I don't think to build a company of the scale that I want to, I don't think I don't think it's going to happen I don't, I, in my lifetime or ever potentially, because I don't think the consumer cares as much about that the slight nuance of the flavor difference between HPP and pasteurized personally. So this slide encompasses like five years of my life. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, so when you say iterate the solutions, again, had I asked for more help earlier on, this would have been faster. But because I didn't, um, and because I really was like, you know, you need to put in a tremendous amount of hard work to, to figure out if a product is working or not. This took a very, very long time. But if you're invested in it, guess what? Things get better. <laughs> so that's we got about five. We got about five minutes, April. Five minutes. Okay, gotcha. I will speed things up. Um, so I think that the next step is, uh, you know, if you've done what I've done up until this point, which is you tested a lot of things, you've gotten some early stage traction and data before you really lean in and invest your life savings, look up this word Ikigai. I didn't have the time to um, put in a full lengthy definition, but you can use Google, which is wonderful. Um, but it's basically the intersection of the things that you love doing, what the world needs, what you can get paid for and what you're good at. I would highly recommend you look at all these things and make sure that you're that you're good at it, that you love it, that there is a market need for it and that you're going to get paid for it. Because if one of these things are missing, it's going to take way too long for you to get returns from whatever opportunity you're going to be building out. In my case, again, I asked the question, do I have the relevant expertise? And again, I won't go into details here, but yes, I have the experience teaching. I've got the experience manufacturing. I've got the food safety. I've got the cocktail menu creation. I've got all the media uh, so I decided, yes, I think there's a massive market opportunity here. And I think I'm, I think I have as good of a chance as anyone to be good at this and to, and to move it forward. I will again, try to make this super quick, but these are just examples of us launching MVPs, minimum viable products, spending as little money as we possibly could to get some results and then keep moving. Um, it goes roughly in chronological order from left-hand side to right-hand side. Um, this is this bottom right-hand side is more recent for us. This is one of our spaces that we now have um, in Brooklyn. We are currently just, again, a, a little bit of an update um, uh, and just some context on where we are right now. We have been, we've done really well. We've been in business now three years as Cheeky. We launched during um, 
uh, the first wave of COVID in 2020. We've done some amazing partnerships. We've sold a ton of product, like a ton, ton, ton of product. We've gotten some really great press recognition. We actually, funny enough, we were only sold in about 250 stores nationwide, but that number should be about 1,000 by Q1 of 2023. And we have some really ag aggressive expansion plans after that point as well. And we're launching with our first real spirits distributors and traditional DSD uh, in October, both in New York and in Tennessee. So we're super excited. So to wrap it up, one caveat, entrepreneurship is not for everyone. So there's definitely, it's very stressful. There's a lot of uncertainty. If these things concern you, maybe not for you. However, the same mentality of problem solving, looking for problems to solve, and then being solutions oriented, this is invaluable in any career you might have or in any role you might have. And so even if entrepreneurship and, and taking, you know, putting a toe into uh, launching your own project is not for you, I think all of these um, skills and all of these, um, this, this mindset really applies to anything you might happen to do. So that is it. Thank you so much. Find me on LinkedIn as April Wachtel. Find Cheeky, cheekycocktails.co or at Cheeky Cocktails on all social media. Uh, and Movers and Shakers, MoversSShakers.com. Whoa, dude. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. No, that was, uh, that was intense. Thank you. <laughs> Packed um, a lot in. <laughs> yeah, you did pack a lot in. Yeah. Uh, and that's, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm going to chop it up into a bunch of different little things. And you just gave me some like the, the perfect little nuggets. Yeah, Thank you. great. Great. Again, I hope it wasn't too abstract and, and high level, but, um, you know, I talk know that we're like, no, I hope that out. I hope that was a kick in the ass, um, to, um, I hope that was a kick in the ass to, uh, for people to start a business. Yeah. Um, uh, so Marilyn is asking um, if you have a on-premise national account solution. Um, I think I would love to know what she means by that. Um, I'll connect you to, I'll connect. You yeah. To. I, I would say just the answer, super quick answer <clears throat> is we have a, we have a lot of connections within national accounts uh, in the on-premise, not in the off-premise. That being said, meeting the needs, like just from a cash flow perspective, being able to finance inventory for even a single national account is not is not even within the realm of possibility uh, until early 2023. Um, so we're working on it, but we also want to make sure that we are supporting all of our partners in the markets that we open and our great partners to our distributors before really chasing down those national accounts. Cool. All right. Well, um, I'll connect you to either way. Um, and uh, thank you so much for doing this, April. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Congratulations on everything. Thank you. Thank you. Talk soon. All right. See you soon. Bye.